Good day. I'm very happy to have this opportunity to talk about Crosshole EM. Although Crosshole EM is a part of a control source EM, the prototype, prototype development or this technology development is relatively recently. In 90s of last century, the prototype system was developed in electric magnetic instrument located in Richmond, California. Quite extensive tests for both hardware and software has been conducted by EMI. However, the commercial development wasn't happened until EMI become part of Schlumberger. The new commercial system was put in the field around 2012. Since then, we have done quite a few commercial surveys in Brazil, China, mostly in Middle East. Today, in this presentation, I'm not intend to give you detailed development about this technology. Rather, I will give you a snapshot about what is Crosswell EM, how Crosswell EM works, and what kind of problem Crosswell EM can address. This is agenda for the presentation. In the introduction, I will use one slide to tell why we develop Crosswell EM. What is the business thinking behind the idea? Now, I will use a few slides to talk about what is Crosswell EM technology, how it works. The most time will be focused on case histories. I will present two case histories. The first one is about fluid monitoring. And the second one is about using Crosswell EM to define fracture system and locate bypass oil. The second example is a very challenging, but the reward is also huge. Then in the end, I try to give a few conclusions. So let's start why we need to develop Crosswell EM. You know, for all kind of geophysical surveys, we always have to think two parameters. One is a survey range. Another one is the resolution. We always try to find one technology which give you largest survey range and also best resolutions. So in, in this figure, I, uh, in the, I with the horizontal axis, horizontal axis is a denoted depth of investigation. The vertical axis is a full resolution. So the first group survey most commonly used in the oil gas industry is logging, like a resistive logging, density logging, nuclear logging, et cetera. Those surveys are bread butters for oil and gas service companies and are very commonly used. This group survey has a very limited depth investigation range typically less than a meter, but also they have very high resolutions. Also typically less than a meter, sometimes some centimeters or dozen centimeters. Then we have another survey, a group survey is located in other part of spectra. Those surveys has very, very large survey range, like tens or hundreds of kilometer. But meanwhile, they also have a, a big, a less desirable resolution for oil gas industry, like tens of meters, even hundreds of meters. The typical example for this kind of survey is like MT, marine MT, surfaces, seismic, et cetera. And then there's a gap between two kind of surveys, which is around say, reservoir, we call them a reservoir scale. It's a range like a kilometer or a little bit more than kilometer, but also give the reasonable resolutions like a meter or a little bit more than a meter. 
So based on this thinking, so we develop a crossword EM, which fall, fall right into these categories. As another technique also can be in this category is called a crossword seismic. So both crossword EM, crossword seismic, it was developed to fit in this gap, provide another uh, measurement tool for oil gas industry. So then what is crossword EM technology? How it works? As indicated by the name, crossword EM needed two wells, one well for transmitter, one well for receiver. So during the measurement, the transmitter will transmit the electromagnetic waves are called a primary field. This primary field will interact with any media or material between two wells, then will generate secondary field and induction current. This induction current will generate secondary field. So both primary field and secondary field will be recorded on the receiver side. So by the data processing and interpretation, we're able to recover receptivity distributions between two wells. So that's the uh, main purpose of a crossword EM survey. That's the ideas behind how the crossword EM survey works. This figure plot the sensitivity function between any pair transmitter and the receivers. As you can see, the sensitivity between one pair transmitter and receiver is limited. It's very much like a cigar shape. That means any resistivity change outside of the area cannot be detected by this pair transmitter and the receiver. It also means if we really want to survey the entire area we are interested, we need a multiple transmitter and the receiver locations. That feature dictates how do we carry out crossword EM survey as following. So first, we put the, for all the four receivers below the target. And we put a transmitter also in the bottom of the well. Then during the survey, the transmitter will moving continuously. Same time will transmit a field to the receivers. When transmitter finish one profile, then we move receivers to another location and transmitter will repeat the same process. In this way, after we finish a survey, the both the transmitter and the receivers will cover multiple locations and the target will be covered by multiple surveys. So this is like a very much just a scan. This technique you can also think is like a scan te technology, very much similar like a people use in the hospital car scan etc. So basically, the whole idea is we need a multiple transmitter and receiver locations to, to fully cover the target that we are interested. Now, the current system that Schlumberger has as a commercial system, by the way, is also only commercial system available in the world, contains a, a, one receiver, which has a two levels, level one, two, three, four, and a transmitter. So transmitters are around 10 meters long and the receivers are around 20 meters long. Both the transmitter and the receivers are vertical magnetic dipole. It's a one component of magnetic dipoles and the transmitter is a, has a very powerful dipole so they can transmit a wave in a long distance. Currently, with the current this system, we, for the well for the survey type, we have a different combinations. The first combination, we call them open, open. That means the hole has nothing inside the ball holes, the purely open holes. In this case, the transmitter and receiver can be separated by 1500 meters. We still can recording reasonable data and we can recover the system, recover the receptivity structures between the wells. So the maximum distance we can do for open, open well is a 1500 meter. Then second configuration is when the well has so-called a fiber class casing. Fiber class casing is non-conductive. So we still can do 1500 meters in this combination. 
Then third setup is when one well is open, another well is still cased. In this case, because the steel casing will decay EM field quite dramatically, so the maximum separation we can do the survey is 700 meters. Then the last combination, when the both wells are still cased, in this case, we cannot do survey as the now. Um, it's simply, there's two reasons. One reason is that, you know, the ball steel casing will basically kill the other field. So, so very little field can be leaked out from two steel casing. Second, and we, you know, when steel casing, when the when you, when you put a magnetic, magnetic dipole behind a steel casing, there are some distortion factors. We have a way to correct a, a casing distortion for receivers, but not for transmitters. So right now, uh, for the steel casing, both as well are steel cased, we cannot do the survey. And uh, uh, typically the cross survey, cross well survey is on the vertical sections. You have two wells. So it is uh, essentially a 2D problem after survey when, the, when you do the interpretations. So typically we'll provide kind of 2D uh, uh, pictures or 2D structures about the restricted distribution between two wells. That's the most typical product from cross well surveys. However, if you have a multiple wells, we can carry out a multiple combination of the survey, then you can put them together. You can construct so-called pseudo 3D sections or multiple 2D sections and one pseudo 3D sections. It's another way to present the, uh, the final products. So typical problem the cross EM can solve is following. First is for the fluid front monitoring. That's in the oil gas industry is a very common common problem, especially when you inject water, you like you like to know where water goes. So the cross or EM can help to monitor the water flow. The second one is how to identify the bypass the pay. Here we mean bypass the pay is uh, let's say you have a two well, both well are produce oil. How if the two wells are kilometers apart. There may some maybe some bypass the pay or maybe some residual between two wells, which you do, we do not know or operators like to know where it is. Then we can use cross OEM to identify or to locate this bypassed oil. oil. Then of course we can use also use cross OEM to enhance the reservoir characterization and the modeling, simply because you can use cross OEM to provide more information. Those information will help you to, to enhance the rest of our monitor, monitor, monitoring and modeling. And of course, the last one, we can also help the, the drilling optimizations. If you can locate where is a bypass oil or residual oil, then of course you can guide uh, new drill, new drillings, which actually I have an example to show, show you for this kind of application. Now let's go to the uh, field examples. First, I'd like to show you so-called uh, we're monitoring water flood. That's uh, one of the most commonly encountered problem in oil field applications is a water flood. So the problem is this. This application is done in the Middle East, uh, close to Abu Dhabi, uh, at an oil field called Buhasa. The Buhasa is a very old, old oil field. It's already started start a secondary recovery, secondary recovery a long time ago. So for the secondary recovery, they did uh, water injection. So the basically the water injection part is they do so-called preferred water injection. Basically, they inject the water along the edge of the oil field. Now, the problem is, if you look at the more detail for the reservoirs, for example, we showed here, there's a two unit of the reservoir, the top unit and the lower unit. The upper unit has a much higher probability than lower unit. So in this case, when the water, when the preferred water comes to this reservoir, of course the water will go to up units because they have a higher probability, water easier to flow in that unit. So the lower unit have a very little water or hardly any water in that case, the lower unit may have a uh, lot of 
left bypassed oil. So it's not a desirable situation. By the way, when we drill, when the operators um, put water in the oil field, they did it for two purposes. One purpose is keep the pressure. Another purpose is to push the oil to the producers. So if the, the lower unit cannot have the water go in, so the water cannot push the oil. So they may left a lot of bypass oil there. In that case, the operator designed a pilot project. They want to change water injection pattern. So they, they use they drilled a horizontal well as injector, then drilled three observation well, try to monitor how the horizontal injector will improve the water injections. So if we look more details on the vertical section, it looks like that. So we basically have an injector go through both the unit four and the unit five. Unit four has a higher prob uh, prob probability than unit five. Basically the difference by three times. One have a 50 mini Darcy and another one only has a 15 mini Darcy. In this case, the injector will limit injecting water only in the unit five, not in the unit four. So in this case, they can force water only stay in unit five. In order to monitor the water injection efficiency, inject water, so they also drill three observation wells, OB1, OB2, and OB3. And they decide to use cross OEM to monitor water injection and see how the water spread inside unit five. So here we showed you and um, how we carry out this project. This project actually is, we did a time-lapse lapse survey. So the first survey did is before the water injection. Here we have three sections, each section corresponding to different well pairs. So for the first section is a OB1, OB3, then the next one is OB1, OB2 in the middle section. The right section is OB2 and OB3. And the injector, injectors are marked in here. So the injector only showed up in the OB1, OB3, and OB1 and the OB2. So this is a before injection. The what we showed here is a resistivity map for all three sections. And the, the injecting water is a very solid water. So it's a conduct, it's a very conductive. So the idea is that we the, the reason we can monitor the water flow is because the water, the injected water will alter or will change conductivity is because simply because the water injected is very conductive. So by monitoring the conductive change, we can find out how the water moves inside the these layers or inside of these reservoirs. So this is, um, we call them a reference uh, uh, map or reference state is before the water injection. Then six months after water injection, we went there again and uh, collect the data and did all the interpretation and inversion again. So we look at the new cross sections for all three wall pairs. As you can see, close injector for the first one, OB1, OB3 section, the water spread around to the both side very nicely and stayed in unit five. Same for the section OB1, OB2, the water also started spread around in both directions and also stayed in unit five. However, for the last section, you need two and a unit uh, observation two and a three is away from injector. So after six months, we haven't seen any water at all. So the water move very slowly. Then after one year, we repeated, we repeated the survey and we get a new <laughs> sections now. For the section OB1 and OB3, we still, the water still, stayed within the unit five reasonably and go both directions. That's what operator wants. They want the water spread at both directions and uniformly. However, in the section OB1 and OB2, the water seems to stop, go to right. Instead, they break up 
to the unit force because the unit force, remember, has a higher permeability. So water is easily go to unit four. And it seems like uh, in this section, the water has a problem to go to right rather than go to the up, the break to the unit four. Then in the last section, OB2, OB3, we still do not see any water. Then we went there again, year and a half later, this time on the first section, OB1, OB3, the, still the water kept in the unit five. However, we can see the water started to break out to the unit four and the close to OB1. And at the same time for OB1, OB2, it's a similar situation than before. It's still water refused to go to right of what has a very difficult time to break to the right side of the unit five rather a lot of water basically just go up to the unit four so basically whatever water you inject it they just go to top to unit four it's an easy pass and for the last section ob2 ob ob2 and ob3 once again we still do not see any water seems like a water movement from injected to that section is a very very slow even after a year and a half we still do not see any water trace in the ob2 ob3 then the last survey we did is basically two years and four months later and the basically the picture is very similar to the one to the previous one and at the first section ob1 ob3 the water Stayed in most most of the water still stayed in the unit five, but it also started break out in the unit four. However, for OB1, OB2, it seems like the water is a refuse, go to the right side of the injector and uh, just keep break out to the top. By the way, we also did a, a survey along the borehole one. This uh, marks is a is a ST survey that's indicated water presented in the in the borehole one, that's a, she has a very consistent between crosswalk survey and a borehole survey. And once again, in the last section, OB2, OB3, we do not see any water at all. So this survey is very interesting for the operators. So basically they show that inside the reservoir, the water flow is very uneven, even in unit five especially in the OB1, OB2, seems like some anisotropy for the water flooding, water flow. That basically, they refuse to go to the right of the injector and stay on the left side and break out to the unit of four. And uh, another thing from uh, section OB2, OB3 is that indicated that the, the water flow is very, very slow. Even after uh, two years and four months, the water still haven't reached that section. So, those, so all these... Uh, uh, result. All those results are very uh, meaningful or useful for the operators. So basically, gives them an idea. The water flood in that section is very slow, so you have to be careful. And also, this uneven. So there's a, a direct. There's some kind of anisotropy before the water flooding in the different um, uh, sections of the uh, reservoir. So all these things has to be considered when they re when they design new water injection pattern. And uh, so this kind of information really you cannot get from any other survey because uh, traditionally the uh, operators only can depend on logging data to determine the, where the water reached the, where the water is. However, only based on logging data is the almost it's impossible to get information between two wells. So cross VM provide a very efficient, very useful means to detect the water flooding and to give you um, easy understand the pictures about a water flood pattern in this case. Now let's switch to second example. This example is basically we try to define a so-called fracture system and locate bypass oil. And this uh, project is conducted in the Saudi Arabia. It's in the oil field, field with a lot of fractures as indicated in these pictures. And the problem with the, uh, the, the problem we have in this project is they have they drill, the operator drilled two horizontal wells to produce oil. The one well used as injector to inject water and another oil, another well is used as a producer to produce oil. The horizontal section is a one kilometer long for both wells and the separation between two wells is 1.3 kilometers. 
So the water injection started at a 2000. And very soon, after a few years, they found out in the producer side, they produce a lot of water, not much oil. Then they test the water, they found out the water they produced is the same water as they injected. So the, the operator suspect that there is a fracture system since this oil field is full of the fractures. There is a fracture system basically channel the water directly from the injector to producer. And the whole point for the operator is like to use the, the water to sweep the whole area that can push oil to the producer to produce oil. So if the, they have the fracture to channel the water, they defeat the purpose of inject the water. So what they did at that time is they cased the top part of the producer and continued to produce the remaining part of the, the producer. So they kept it for a few more years. Then they found out the water just too much water they cannot keep production. So they shut down the produce at production at 2013. Now, they really like to understand what's going on between two wells. They want to, if do they have a fracture system, do I have a fracture system, fracture system which channel the water and where it is. Another most important thing for them, do they have a bypassed oil still stayed between the two wells? So for that two purpose, they, decide to use cross EM to, for this project. And however, for us, this is a very challenging project simply because so far, all our cross EM is done on the vertical wells. We never did on horizontal wells. So the first problem that we have in mind is with the horizontal well, it, you have a two, one component magnet dipole. For the vertical well, this magnet, the vertical magnet dipole has a very good coupling with the horizontal layers. But if you put a transmitter and receiver inside the horizontal layer, the coupling is almost a minimum. So the first question we have is, can we do it? Can we use cross EM in this kind of situations? So for the whole project, we have a long really it's long planning. So basically the project set up in 2012. So in order to really understand how we can carry out the cross EM survey in horizontal wells, we did an extensive simulation in 2013. Only after we get a very positive results from simulation, then we started to do the data collection in the field at 2014. And then after data collection, we did an interpretation and an inversion to get a restricted structures between two wells, which try to address the problem operator has. Then actually after that, we also try to convert the resistivity structure into the saturation map. So this is all the process we did. It takes multiple years to finish this project. It's a big, it's a big project, very challenging. Then first we did a simulation, they call it pre-service simulation because we try to understand how the coupling goes between horizontal wells and the targets. So what we did is the following, since we have the trajectory for both horizontal wells, so we use a 3D simulation code. We put the horizontal wells into our code. Then we construct artificial fractures. With, for this case, with, for the three fractures between two wells. Then we do the forward calculation. So here we showed you forward calculation. By the way, this called, we call this uh, a map, a pseudo magnetic field map. This basically is a forward calculation for the cross EM. The horizontal axis is for all the transmitter locations and the vertical axis for all the receiver locations. So in this map, we basically show the magnetic field strength for all combinations of transmitter receivers. So it's a very compact way. It's a compact way to show all the field data in for the cross EM survey. It's our standard map. This is only forward calculation. So we first calculation, we, we calculate the uh, total magnetic fields without the fractures. Then we calculate again with the fractures. From this two map, you can't see any difference. That's simply because the total field is too strong and the second fields are weak. So we cannot see any difference from the total magnetic field. If we take a difference 
between the two calculations, the with fracture, without fracture, take the difference. Then we have a so-called secondary field due to the fractures, as you can clearly see that all the fractures are clearly showed up in the secondary fields. That means cross or EM do have a sensitivity for horizontal wells with the fractures. Then this is only forward calculation. We also carried out inversion simulations to try to see, okay, seems like we can detect the fractures but how well we can recover fractures. So in this case, we use a single fracture and with the same uh, two horizontal wells. Then we, we calculate the, the field, the magnetic field, total magnetic field. Then we add noise, just make them more field-like. And uh, just like you do the field survey, they have a noise data. Then we do inversion and try to see how well we can recover the structures. As in this case, as you can see, it's not too bad, although we cannot really 100% recover the true structures because you know inversion is always has limitations and um, we can never go back to true structures. But nevertheless, the recovered structure is not too bad, the represent representations of the true structure. So in this case, we basically adhere, we basically indicate that yes, our crosswall EM not only have a sensitivity for the fractures, we can also recover the fractures under suitable conditions. So at this stage, we say, yes, our simulation is successful. We do have a sensitivity. We are ready to go to the field. Then the field survey is another challenge because uh, as indicated before, as I pointed out before, when we do the crosswall EM survey, we need to have a multiple transmitter and the receiver locations, which is easier for vertical wells uh, simply because the gravity will allow, will allow us, will help us to do the move the transmitter and receivers back and forth, back and forth in the vertical wells. However, in the horizontal wells, that's not easy at all. I mean, how to move the transmitter receiver back and forth it's very challenging. So here we use a coil tubing. It's a, a special system which can put transmitter in the coil tubing and help them moving back and forth inside horizontal wells. It takes a long time and uh, be, has to be very careful to do the survey. We did this after six days of field operation, we collect 140 data profiles. That means 140 receiver location, 140 multiple transmitter locations. And the good thing is we get excellent data quality. And here we show the, uh, um, all the receiver locations for the data, collect data. As you can see, each curve are smooth and correlated in each other. Actually, this is the best cross soil data we ever collected. And the reason for that, we think it is the following. When you have when, when you're the transmitter receiver in the vertical wells, you know, the what the, the transmitter receiver is hanging in the air. So mechanically it's very not very stable. So any movement will cause noise. And our receiver is a very, very sensitive, sensitive magnetic dipoles. So any minor mechanical movement will become noise disturbing our field. However, in horizontal field, horizontal wells, the both transmitter and receiver will sit down on the well. So they are very stable, mechanically very stable. So practically have no mechanical noise. That's probably why we have excellent data. Now, since we have best, very good data, the next step is we need the inversion to recover the receiver structures. That's another challenge. Actually, we have two different challenges. One challenge, as I mentioned before, this whole horizontal wells have two sections. One is open, open. One is open to steel. Remember that a receiver, receiver well or produce well, part of the produce well is cased by steel casing. So we, our surveys cover both the open part and the steel section in the receiver well. And also, of course, how to handle 3D inversion with the horizontal wells. So first part we do, we have to deal with the so-called uh, how to uh, match with the open open wheel data, data and open case data as one example we showed here. And this part receiver is in, located behind the steel casing and this part receiver located on the open wheel. Of course, there's a big 
difference between field strains simply because of casing distortions. So of course we need to recover the uh, we need to correct the casing distortion on the on the receivers on the receivers for this part of a survey data. For this, we at Schlumbach have developed the proprietary technology, which allow us to correct uh, casing distortion for each receivers. And these corrections are built into the inversion. So when we do inversion, the inversion code will automatically detect receiver location and do the corrections. So this part is long term, long time development, but now it's a part of a inversion process. Now the next challenge is inversion itself. You know, we have in the we mentioned it before for the vertical for the vertical wells. We mostly just do 2D inversion simply because at that time, in that case, and the vertical section, our strike direction is good along the layer direction. So you can use 2D, uh, use a 2D inversion. In this case, our transmitter and the receiver are located in the horizontal wells. So our strike direction actually is a point to the layer, layer direction, layer sections. So we have to use the 3D inversion for this case. And um, then 3D section, you involve many more many more unknowns. In this case, we have a half million unknowns, but only have 25,000 data points. Clearly, it's a severely undervalued inversion issues. So basically, your data is limited within a, thin, a very thin reservoir layers. And you try we try to invert this whole 3D structure. It's a very, very difficult. So we need all the constraint to really limiting our inversion, trying to get a meaningful results. At the very beginning, when we finish a survey, when we start an inversion, myself uh, uh, still sitting in, in located in California, in the Richmond, California. At that time, we do not have much more information about the, the two borehole structures. So we do not have much more uh, idea how to construct a study model. So here, we that time we use uh, two simple study models. One simply just a uniform study model. Another one, we based on some logs, we put uh, some simple stru uh, layer structures into the study model. We try to see whether we can get uh, any kind of um, inversion results from the two different study model. As you can see, with, when you have a uniform, regardless, regardless of what study model you have, the uniform layer or uh, uniform structure or layer structure, you can see the inverted results are a lot of artifact. And that means um, our study model probably too far away from real structure. So we probably fall into local minimum and the 3D problem is very, very nonlinear and we have very little constraint. We cannot really reach our final model just with a simple study model. We need a better study model and other constraint. So basically this try indicated that we cannot use a simple study model. We cannot, if we use a simple study model, we cannot get a meaningful in, inverted structures. So now let's look how we can constrain our inversions. So here I showed uh, logs. These are uh, uh, three logs from a vertical well nearby our horizontal well. It's, not a, uh, it's nearby our survey area, near the horizontal wells. So look at uh, the, the middle section, the middle one, the log is called a porosity. As you can see, the reservoir we are in has a high porosity and the sections above our reservoir and below the reservoir have very low porosity. So that gave us an idea that, you know, remember the water injection, both transmitter and receiver wells are confined in this layer. So the injected water should be stay inside the reservoir simply because the top part and lower part has a very low porosity. The water will have a hard time to go to top and go to the, the lower part. So the water will mostly contained in the reservoir. So basically on this argument, so we really do not invert the top part and the lower part. We really only need to invert the reservoir part. So if we can construct a good 3D study model and um, fix the top part, fix the lower part, only invert 
um, the reservoir part, we probably can get reasonable structures. So that's the idea. We try to con constrain our inversion. In order to do that, we need to have a good study model. We need to have all the information we can get to construct our study model. So in 2015, I was transferred to Saudi Arabia, still for, still for Schlumberger. After trans transfer to the after I started in working in Saudi Arabia, I can work closely with operators uh, Saudi Ramago. And from them, I get uh, much more information. We have we they have very detailed, very good petrophysical model. From their petrophysical model, I can construct the new study model. And in this case, we have very good control in the top part and the lower part of Above the above and below reservoir. So in the new surveys, we fix the top part and, and, and the lower part only invert the reservoirs. So that's new inversion results. As you can see, the new inversion results are much reasonable. And that's simply because we have much, much better study model and which allow us to just invert reservoir sections without touch any other part. And after many iterations, after many uh try and arrows, eventually I come to this 3D model. So this 3D model, you can see very interesting. They have a, a, a very conductive, this is a purple color is a very conductive, it's a, around one ohm meter or below one ohm meter. And we also have a reddish color that's more resistive. So this purple color is indicated fracture, basically indicated fracture system. Basically, this is like a water pass. Whenever injector inject water, the water will go from the water pass go to the producers. And this reddish color is basically indicated part of the reservoir, which supposed to be swept by water, but probably never had water simply because the water all goes through the fracture part instead of go to the uh, rest part of the reservoir. And these conductors are what is a water table. That's what already there has nothing to do with injector water. So this part, we do, we do not pay attention. We really need to focus our attention on the on this section and on also the non-water sections. So after I presented the water to, uh, presented the model to operators, they have some questions. They're basically a very simple question. They say the fracture they see in the field, most of, of them are just a small fractures, like a very tiny fractures, like a centimeter or 10 centimeter, maybe less than a meter thick. How can your fracture is like hundreds of meters or tens of meters, hundred meters thick? Well, my interpretation is, well, you, the field engineers or petrophysicists are see single fractures, but an EM with a 1.4 kilometer, uh, kilometer apart and an EM cross survey, we see fracture system. I'm, pr I'm pretty sure they have a lot of fractures here. We just see fracture system. We cannot see single fractures. Another thing we need to keep in mind, I tell the operator, is that the, the inversion is a smooth process. So they have a smoothing effect. Maybe, you know, the fracture is not as uh, uh, thick as this one, but uh, due to the smear effect, it looks like it's uh, thick, but uh, simply just because of all the water effect here and it's spread around. So it looks like a bigger uh, uh, fractures. And however, uh, we cannot give a sharp boundary. We cannot give, really give a very sharp uh, definition for the fracture itself. So that's uh, basically the idea. But uh, nevertheless, it is a conductor. If we replace as a conductor, we cannot fit the data. If I actually tried that, I replaced the conductor with a resistor, then the data fit is much worse. So I really can convince them we need this uh, huge conductor here. It is due to fracture system. That is a water pass. In order to prove that and uh, convince the operator, I'd also show the uh, data fit. The same thing, we have we show the data fit in two sections. One section is with the case hole data, another section is open hole data. And the, the data format is the same thing. We have a, a pseudo, pseudo magnetic uh, section, pseudo map for magnetic field. So the top part is uh, we measure data and the middle part is uh, calculate data from our final model. The lower section is a difference between two. As you can see, for both case hole data and the open hole data, the data fit uh, very well. And uh, we also 
uh, uh, fit, uh, show the data fit along the two wells. This is for the transmitter wells, it's for the receiver wells. So the red one is uh, received, recovered from our 3D model. The black one actually is a borehole log did with a borehole logging tool that's called an AIT log. Although the, the, the OO trend is very similar, the details are different. And that's simply because actually the two comparison is not tried up to up a comparison because our 3D model based on data, based on a crossword EM survey that's done in the 90 hertz. The black one, the AIT log is, there's a recipe log it did on 26,000 hertz. So the two different survey has total different uh, uh, range, survey range. So it's not quite up to up comparison, but the, nevertheless, the overall uh, uh, structure, overall data fit is uh, reasonable. So that shows that uh, our model basically can fit our data. Typically, after we have a con uh, get a conducted model, we normally stop here. But for petrophysicists and engineers in the oil and gas field, they are not interested in the conductor, conductivity distribution. They are more interested in the saturation distribution. So the, our next job is convert the conductivity into the saturation. In order to do that, we use so-called Arch formula. This is a very popular formula used by petrophysicists. Basically, they allow us to allow the petrophysics to calculate water saturation based on the bunch of different parameters. That basically here, in order to calculate the water saturation, we need to, to, to know five parameters. One is the porosity, one is the real resistivity, one is the water resistivity, and then the one N is so-called saturation expon exponent. M is called cementation exponent. So we need to know all these five parameters in order to calculate the water saturation. So next slide, I show you how do we reach all these five parameters. So basically, first, first parameter primary the porosity. We did a petrophysical simulation simply because we have a lot of data, seismic data, different logging data. This all this data allow petrophysics to do a kind of detailed mapping for the porosity in the area we surveyed. So we first one use um, petrophysical simulation and get a porosity. Then the next important thing is the real resistivity. That one can only uh, obtain from crossword EM survey. So basically by the crossword EM survey, we are able to get a 3D resistivity distribution, which allow us to define the resistivities between two wells. Then third one, we needed to know the water resistivity. For that, we needed to know salt, salt concentration in the area, which we have another petrophysical modeling, which allow us to calculate the salt concentration. Once you know the salt concentration, you can calculate the water resistivities. The last one is MN. MN is more complex. MN, there's a two parameters that depend on the rock type, depend on the porosity, depend on the rock type, and also depend on the pole type. So it's very complex and they depend on the microstructures. There's no way you can calculate MN. The only way you can get MN is through the lab. So we have to get um, core samples, use a lab test, lab experiment to define MN. So once you define all these parameters, then we can finally calculate the water saturation. So after all this process, we are successfully transformed from conductive, conductivity map into the saturation map. As you can see, the saturation map, the basic structure is very similar to the conductive map. So basically you have a high water saturations along the fractures. Here they also have a layer fract later fractures, different fracture system, they have high water saturations. And at a reddish color, they do not have a water, so they have a very low water saturation. So the basically is a similar picture, but uh, for the petrophysicists, they like to see the water saturation distributions. Now, it should be, I should finish the presentation now here now because we are getting everything now. However, and uh, when I was in uh, Saudi Arabia, when I finished all this presentation to the uh, Saudi Ramco, one day I found myself in that conference 
with a bunch of petrophysicists and the pet, uh, field engineers. And they told me, they said, yes, we like your model. You convinced us your model is a valid model. Now we want to drill the well to test your model to see, can we find bypass oil? Wow, that's really challenging. So I say, well, basically say, where to put a well? I told them, say, if you want to find bypass oil, the, mo the best possibility is on this reddish color. The argument is the following. We know this reservoir layer has a high porosity. And we know the water, most of the water goes through the water channel. And here, very little water inside of this area. If very little water, that means they still have a high resistivity. We know oil has a high resistivity, the high, high porosity. So the high resistivity might relate it with the high oil concentrations. So that's an argument. The, the most possible place you can find oil is in the reddish color. So if you want to drill well, that's probably the best place to put your well. Well, that's what they did. And the operator drilled a new well and targeted this reddish area. Guess what? They do find a good oil column and they produce good oil. Actually, the oil, this field, this well is still producing as we're speaking. So this is the first crossroad EM result. Actually, is only crossroad EM result be tested by drilling and success, successfully tested by drilling. So it's really kind of interesting. You know, as you can see, this is a very complex project. It's very challenging. But at the end, the rewarding is also enormous because they found oil based on the cross EM result. So in summary and conclusion, I would say cross EM is excellent resistivity image tools at the reservoir scale and a very efficient for monitoring fluid movements. It's capable to locate a bypass oil in a fracture reservoirs. But then in order to do crosswalk survey, we needed to have a two wells, and normally we, normally it's two D images. Well, at at right now we cannot work two steel cased wells. So I like to also make a one more comment before I finish the talk. Although that both examples for oil and gas field, actually the crosswalk EM can also for use for mineral explorations. In fact, before I joined Schlumberger, I was working in Canada for INCO. At that time, I already used the Crossroad EM for mining exploration and for mining planning with a quite interesting result. So, so Crossroad EM is also can be useful for mining applications. Another thing uh, Crossroad EM can also use for uh, monitor the CO2 movement. So basically for CO2 sequestration, risk cross EM may also find uh, useful. Although we never collect the data for the CO2 monitoring, but I did a quite, a, quite extensive, quite extensive simulation for CO2 monitoring and the results are very positive. So basically cross EM is a, a different uh, technology and it too can be very useful for some uh, cases which surface EM may not be efficient. That will be the end of my presentation. Thank you.